1. Debing Creek Heritage Assessment for the Protection of the Former Mission Lands. This report is a brief and overall assessment of the cultural, historical, archaeological, spiritual and environmental value of the undeveloped sectors still in their natural state around Debing Creek. Warning: Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander viewers are warned that the following report contains names and images of deceased persons. Disclaimer: The old photos, artworks and some texts used in this report were found online in the public domain and are reproduced in this Creative Commons compilation for fair use, for non-commercial, educational and study purposes. Reproduction, printing, sharing and distribution of any or all parts of this document are greatly encouraged and appreciated, to help spreading a reflection on historical truth and gather wider support to a crucial cause of indigenous sovereignty, human rights and environment. Note. The terms Aboriginals and Aborigines are not favoured by many of those they are meant to describe. Some prefer other designations like Indigenous. First Nations, Natives, Original Peoples, Originals, Sovereign Originals, Original Sovereigns, Original Tribes, Original Mobs, Traditional Owners, Traditional Custodians, Murrays, Gorys, Corys, or various names in their respective languages. We acknowledge and respect this cultural preference and apologize for any inconvenience that could be caused by the use of the more formal terms Aboriginals and Indigenous in this report, for general clarity within conventional and legal terminology while honoring the ways they choose to use. The terms Murray Murrays are used in places, as it is common in language in southeastern Queensland especially referring to the modern Aboriginal community born during the mission era of intermarriages between displaced Aboriginal individuals of different tribes, with members of other ethnic groups. Known as historical people, those Murrays have most often lost their languages and the history of their origins, and they are often a mixed blood, but they definitely identify themselves as Aboriginals. Old photo of the tribes at Deebing Creek, late 1800s. 1. The cultural heritage of Deebing Creek. 1. AA ancestral heritage. Since thousands of years and until this day, the lands around Deebing Creek have been hosting Aboriginal communities and cultural activities. Artifacts found on these grounds include stone tools, scar trees, and ancient throwing sticks that were crafted on site. Some trees, an ancient borer ground and other sites hold a special spiritual and cultural significance. Today, the community still gathers on those grounds for cultural events like ceremonies, classes, councils, and cultural practices such as gardening, gathering medicinal plants, cold burning, or apprenticeship of skills like didgeridoo playing and dance. The Yuggera are considered as the traditional custodians of the territory, although the grounds at Deebing Creek were used by various tribes, namely during the Triennial Bunya festivals and gatherings. During the mission days, people from numerous tribes, from at least 60 locations, were sent on site. There were famous chiefs, successful athletes and an opera singer recorded as living at Deebing Creek. There are stories and legends related to specific sites around Deebing Creek like the Danger Gully Dog, a powerful clever man killed in a massacre, whose spirits is still seen and heard, haunting the woods. The story of a group of schoolchildren massacred by gunmen has also been passed on in oral tradition. Accounts mention between 50 and 60 children killed with their teacher Ms. Julia Ford whose headstone dated from 1896 stands alone in the cemetery, recent radar survey found mass graves nearby. Deebing Creek meanders north for about 16 kilometers between flanking affluence and billabongs. Parallel to it and flowing north to the Bundamba Creek to the east and Perga Creek to the west. The entire catchment at Deebing Creek covers 26 square km, from its sources in the Grampian Hills to where it meets the freshwater section of the lower Brisbane River, where West Ipswich stands today. 
The lower part of the catchment has been heavily urbanized, but an area of about 3 square km in the upper catchment, that was part of the Deebing Creek Reserve, has been preserved in its natural state. Apart from fields cleared for farming and living during the mission days, the area is covered with bush, providing a natural habitat to a diversified wildlife and flora, with endangered species like the koala. These undeveloped sectors have been used by Aboriginal communities for cultural activities until now. 1. AB Billabongs and Water Catchment Dams the entire natural lands around Deebing Creek included on the former reserve, hold several ancestral billabongs and ancient water catchment dams. There are at least a dozen of such billabongs within the close vicinity of Grampian Drive and more deeper in the bush, attesting that a large number of people, likely at least in the hundreds, lived here and occupied these grounds since pre-colonial times and into the mission days. From the different styles of the embankments, two dams might have been dug or enlarged during the mission days, while all the rest show the characteristics of Aboriginal billabongs. These waterholes had been the only source of life-sustaining water, until tanks were installed in 1897. Those waterholes sustain a diversified wildlife and flora and deserve to be preserved as nature refuge. Species of turtles, frogs, snakes and lizards including the lace monitor, kangaroos, koalas, possums, dingoes and various species of birds, fish and insects depend on those billabongs for their survival. While Australia has been facing severe droughts for years, the billabongs and dams must be protected. One of the waterholes on the former mission grounds Another waterhole on the former mission grounds. 1. AC Heritage Trees. The whole area of the former mission reserve also hosts a diversity of plants and trees that are valued for their medicinal properties or cultural usages, namely various types of gums and the paper bark tree. Among them, the Melaleuca urbiana or swamp tea tree is an endangered plant, and there is more than one hectare recorded at Deebing Creek with the state and the Commonwealth, and two specimens of Calitris baileyi or Bailey's cypress pine, near threatened under the Queensland Nature Conservation Act. Near the creek, by the old mission location, there is an impressive bunya pine towering over all the other trees. The Bunya tree has been protected in Australia by the creation of the Bunya Bunya Reserve in 1840, to protect its habitat, and in 1842 the colonial authorities prohibited settlers from cutting them. It is the only tree in Australia that was officially recognised as sacred for the Aboriginals by the British. The bunya pine is a very ancient species that used to feed dinosaurs, and it is both male and female. It is well known as an ancestral sacred tree where neighboring groups would gather for harvest about every three years, when the bunya would shed its cones and nuts, to share ceremonies, trade and intermarry, as sites around the bunya were peacefully shared and held as highly sacred by all the tribes. The tribes keeping the bunya sent messengers to all tribes months ahead when the cones would be ripe. People walk for months to attend the Bunya festivals, gather and share the 10 to 14 kilo cones. The seeds were carried and planted in special sites, such as sacred ceremonial and gathering grounds. The last Bunyi or Bunya nut festivals are believed to have happened in Queensland around 1900. Historical records archived at the University of Queensland describe the triennial Bunyi or Bunya Nut Festival in these terms. There is evidence from the 1840s of regular mass movements of Aborigines from as far south as the Richmond and Tweed Rivers, across the McPherson Range through a number of scrub tunnels, and from the headwaters and valleys of the Narang, Albert and Logan Rivers, through Ugumbia Yugara Territory north to the Bunya Mountains, for the Triennial Feast. The Dugandan and Fassifern scrubs, mostly impenetrable to Europeans until open for selections, concealed a century-assault tract known to the indigenous people who journeyed through it. 
After visiting the Fassi fern, the young German scientist, Dr. Ludwig Leichhardt, wrote in August 1843 that the Aborigines had told him, that the trees bear a heavy crop once in three years, which draws the clans from near and far. For three months, every third year, Aborigines assembled, to feast on the nourishing bunya kernels. Clearly an overlap in common vocabulary and common pronunciation was bound to evolve from regular social intercourse amongst neighbors, and even distant acquaintance. The Bunya tree at Deebing Creek Mission is centuries old and certainly one of the tallest standing in Australia, deserving an official survey and protection. It still produces a considerable amount of protein-rich nuts, a valuable food source. An ancient Bora ring at its feet was a spiritual and cultural gathering place. This bunya stands as a witness to history and attests to the cultural importance of the grounds. Inside of the bunya are two giant centuries-old sacred birthing trees, that were used for women as safe places to give birth. The closest one is around 200 meters from the bunya tree. The other one is on the hill, at the old mission location next to the ruins of two WW2 era metal hangars. These two birthing trees, where several generations of Aboriginals were born, are important cultural sites to be protected. There are also some old fruit trees nearby dating from the mission times, including a big fig tree, a date palm tree, and an important quantity of prickly pear cacti. Prickly pears are also abundant on lands along Grampian Drive north of Centenary Highway A5. This fruit-bearing cactus was imported, and evidence shows that it was grown, as they often grow in lines or in large patches of considerable ages. The bunya pine. One of the birthing trees on the left, with the bunya in the background right. 1. Historical heritage of Deebing Creek. 1. B8 prior to the mission days, the killing times. The name Deebing itself is an Aboriginal word translating as mosquito or other small winged insects. The traditional custodians of the region around Deebing Creek are the Jergabal, Jagara, Yugara, Yugarapul, who locally call themselves the Yugara Yugarapul people. Neighboring tribes mentioned in the region by various accounts from anthropologists, historians and Murray elders, include the Biri consisting of the Jakam Ugembe, the Kitabal and the Jergabal, the Yerongpan Yerumpan, Waka Waka, Kabi Kabi and Bunjalong among others, that have also used or visited the region for walkabouts, hunting, gathering, trading and intermarrying, namely during the Triennial Bunya Festival. The short history of colonial Australia is one of the most brutal and atrocious, yet so hidden and denied. In 1816, Governor Lachlan Macquarie's orders to his troops were clear as to the invaders' intentions. All Aborigines from Sydney onwards are to be made prisoners of wars and if they resist they are to be shot and their bodies hung from trees in the most conspicuous places near where they fall, so as to strike terror in the hearts of surviving natives. Although revisionists try today to diminish the crimes, presenting such men as heroes, even humanitarians, soldiers followed orders and committed massacres, heads were often severed and sent to Europe. Macquarie justified the killings of innocents with the need to terrorize the survivors, and blamed the violence on their refusal to surrender, although they were ambushed and given no chance to do so. Less than 30 years after the arrival of the First Fleet, the plan of colonization of Australia through systematic genocide had been laid out and executed. Today, most Aboriginals do not celebrate Australia Day on January 26, which they rather call Invasion Day and is seen as the beginning of the violent land grab through applied systemic genocidal policies. Around 1825, only 55 years after Cook, Southeast Queensland's Aboriginal population had dropped by half from 20,000 to 10,000, according to historian of Brisbane Aboriginals Ray Kirkhub's estimates. The History of Brisbane, 
third largest city in Australia, greatly influenced that of nearby Deebing Creek. There were two clans speaking the Yuggera language, living in Brisbane area that they called Meenjin. In 1824, Surveyor General John Oxley described the hunters he encountered at Tawong, in the area near the Brisbane River, as the strongest and best-made muscular men, he had ever observed. After thousands of years of occupation, the Ipswich area entered written history in 1827 with the arrival of Patrick Logan and convicts who founded the mining settlement of Limestone, today's Ipswich. Logan and his escort were killed near the lime kilns by today's Queen's Park, by Yuggera warriors defending their grounds from the invader. Soon, a military detachment was sent to protect the kilns. Logan is not remembered for his good deeds, only his bad. His cruel treatment of the convicts at Morden Bay earned him the title The Fell Tyrant and made him the subject of one of Australia's best known folk songs, Morden Bay, which describes the horrific plight of convicts under his rule. Misconduct earned them up to 300 lashes and many died, strapped to the flogging frame. Logan was feared and despised by the convicts, and the final verse of Morden Bay rejoices at his violent death. Quote from the Ghosts of Queensland, Chapel Hill. Reports tell of several convicts who escaped the penal colony of Brisbane to go live with the Yuggera. In 1829, botanist Charles Fraser visiting the region described the practice of fire stick, management, consisting in periodic cold burning of the underbrush and grasslands to encourage new growth and attract game, with which Aboriginals have maintained and developed their environments for millennia. Tribes of Southeastern Queensland. Ancient sites between Brisbane and Deebing Creek. According to different estimates, the pre-colonial Yuggera population ranged between 4,000 and 16,000. Several historic reports mention 5,000 in the Morden Bay and Brisbane area alone, so the figure of 16,000 over the whole Yuggera territory covering 1,200 square kilometres is certainly quite reasonable. One chief was said to be able to raise 3,000 warriors, prompting the colonial authorities to a brief truce. In 1842, the infamous mass poisoning of about 60 Gubby Gubby. Jinjubari and Dalla in Kilcoy, about 80 kilometers north of Deebing Creek, degraded the relations into continuous frontier wars. The One Tree Hill battle led by Multugara in 1843, gave the victory to the Yuggera and allied tribes. Multugara and his warriors plundered convoys on their lands and let the settlers run away unharmed but a party of nearly 100 officers and militia tracked them for weeks and ended up defeating them. By the 1840s, 12,000 sheep and over 1,600 cattle grazed around Ipswich and there was ploughed fields. The 1843 annual report on the state of the Aborigines in the Morden Bay district written by Dr. Stephen Simpson stated that 150 Aboriginals were living in limestone, as Ipswich was then called. Simpson ran a police corps until 1847, noting that Aboriginals wanting to join met tribal disapproval. Ipswich rivaled with Brisbane as state capital, as both cities and surroundings were quickly colonised. In 1842, three white settlements were founded in Brisbane. In 1846, there were less than 1,000 settlers in the Brisbane region. In the 1860s, there was around 6,000 whites and 5,000 blacks in the area. Starting in the 1840s, official policies in Brisbane, that soon spread throughout Queensland, banned Aboriginal camps in towns' surroundings and started chasing the existing tribes into the hinterland. Attacks on Aboriginal camps in Brisbane were numerous. Those camps at Breakfast Creek, Victoria Park, South Brisbane, Spring Hill or Barambin, Anogera, Woolugaba, Tawong, Bowen Hills, Newstead, Nunda and Nudgee were pre-colonial settlements that gradually got surrounded. 
each was hosting 500 to 600 people on a regular basis, and networks of pathways connected them to the country. Until the 1860s, tribes still held corroborees in today's Brisbane area, gathering hundreds of people. Skirmishes multiplied and turned into continuous border wars and systematic extermination massacres. Records show that from the 1850s to the 1870s, the Yugara population declined drastically and their number was decimated to the point where they were on the brink of extinction around Ipswich by 1880. M. E. Gregg, the daughter of Robert Dunn, a pioneer of Harrisville west of Perga Creek in 1863, remembered having seen large numbers of friendly aborigines of the Yugara Yugarapul tribes in the region in her youth. Historic accounts also describe how Ipswich was a place where the tribes would at times stage skillful battles, sometimes bloody, to settle disagreements. But, an article from 1940 in the Queensland Times about the history of Ipswich described these people, men, according to explorers, who were shy, but were of striking physique and vigour. Yet an early Ipswich chronicler recorded that these natives were poisoned like dogs, through eating arsenic in flour or damper they accepted in good faith from the white man. No wonder the newcomer was regarded as a natural enemy for a time. Starting from the early days of the colonisation, massacres of Aboriginals were committed across Australia, with a shocking number documented in southeastern Queensland alone, and in Ipswich area. The Colonial Frontier Massacres Project at the University of Newcastle published a map in 2019 with 311 identified locations of massacre sites, estimating at over 500 the number of massacres nationwide. A massacre is defined in this research as a killing of six individuals or more at the same place and time. In comparison, in Australian history, there are only a dozen of massacres of settlers, done in retaliation. Those border wars raids conducted by both official and civilian parties were not all recorded by history. The Australian frontier conflicts gives a list of 335 attacks, raids or skirmishes in Queensland alone. The colonial authorities created the Native Police Corps formed with displaced Aboriginal survivors of massacres under white officers, considered as the largest killing force of Aboriginals in Queensland. Dovey Map of Massacre Sites in Australia Estimates are the numbers of Aboriginal men, women and children killed by the Native Police in Queensland alone range between 10,000 and 65,000, and it is widely agreed among historians that the intensity of the killings during the Queensland Frontier Wars was worse than anywhere else in Australia. Historians say 97% of people killed in the Frontier Wars were Aboriginals, an average of 34 per attack. The Queensland Native Mounted Police's headquarters were located at Sandgate, next to the Brisbane River and were flooded in 1974, conveniently, destroying and completely erasing from history all the archived records. Yet it is known that no agent was ever charged or jailed for any killing of Aboriginals. Throughout its existence the Queensland Native Police established over 200 base camps that they occupied sometimes for months, sometimes for decades, and from which they conducted attacks. The Native Police had a brutal reputation for ambushing and murdering entire tribes indiscriminately. The unspeakable cruelties and atrocities of the horrific massacres led to denial and cover-up in today's Australian society. They included rapes, dismemberment, beheading and body parts carried as trophies. Some Aboriginal victims were mutilated or maimed and left to suffer slow deaths. Others were abandoned to starve chained to boulders. The corpses were often disposed of in pyres or mass graves. The New South Wales Native Police was created in 1848. Queensland separated as a colony in 1859. The Queensland's Native Police was created in 1859 and conducted raids until the early 20th century. 
The Queensland Corps was Australia's longest operating native police serving a simple goal, the violent removal of indigenous from their homelands to open them to colonisation and white settlement. The native police was more a military corps than a police force, employed to push back the frontier. Most of their frontier violence went unreported and often occurred hidden under the veil of secrecy. Their tactic was to attack camps and disperse, the aboriginals, which in reality meant shooting them. The survivors were often taken into forced labor or gathered in refugee camps, sometimes near towns. Interracial sexual relations and widespread rape accelerated the formation of a mixed blood population. These half-caste, or mixed-breed, groups as they were called, added to combinations of depleted tribes and displaced diasporas, contributed to the development of the modern Murray Gori Kori identity. This research found little to no record documenting activities or events at Deebing Creek before 1860. The closest recorded massacre found was in 1860, when Frederick Wheeler, one of the most infamous native police officer with one of the deadliest detachment in Australian history, killed an unknown number of Aboriginals by Flinders Peak, near Ipswich. Deebing Creek is situated between the two. Wheeler had run the native police in Brisbane area during the 1850s and conducted countless raids and attacks on Aboriginals. In 1861, he was under scrutiny for the atrocities his squad committed, but was saved by immunity of prosecution that protected native police officers from justice. Over the years Wheeler was admonished, redeployed, dismissed, reinstated and accused of murder, but never charged. Complaints about his tactics made by clergymen, doctors, journalists and witnesses were ignored for years even when other police officers turned against him. He perpetrated many massacres in the region for years, possibly at Deebing Creek and elsewhere in Queensland in his career that lasted two decades. After beating to death a young boy, he was released for a small bail, as the government feared that he knew too much about the atrocities of the native police since 1857 and he could destroy its reputation. He is quoted as saying that Aboriginal people all must suffer, for the innocent must be held responsible for the guilt of others, statement which the government officially disapproved, without stopping him. It is unsure if he conducted a massacre at Deebing Creek, but records confirm he did too in 1860 in close locations, by Flinders Peak and in Fassey Fern, both within a few kilometres from Deebing Creek. Throughout the mid and late 1800s, there are several reports of massacres in the nearby vicinity, including a six-week campaign by the Browns Vigilante Death Squad, followed by a raid by the native police around Redbank Station in 1857, a mass killing in Flinders Peak and one in Fassey Fern in 1860, investigated but left without consequences a large-scale massacre in neighboring Ugambe Territory in 1862, where Logan is now located, and series of attacks around Perga Camp extending over decades. These massacres were within 30 kilometers from Deebing Creek and represent only a partial list. During the 1860s, punitive expeditions and raids multiplied all over Queensland, with rape and murder. In 1861, a report from the Legislative Assembly of Queensland already denounced the excessive force and the unlawful abuses of the native police troopers but with no more consequences than reprimands. Several times, native police troopers were shot by their own corps, always without consequences. When reports of raids were recorded with an unknown number of deaths, often only one was counted. There is a long list of military, native police officers, squatters and colonists involved in massacres. William Fraser, known as one of the most ruthless and most prolific mass murderer in Australian history, started his killing raids in 1857, when he was in Limestone, Ipswich they lasted over a decade across southeastern Queensland, from Rockhampton to Toowoomba and in the hinterland to Wandoan. 
Fraser started conducting punitive expeditions after seven members of his family had been killed by members of the Iman tribe, in retaliation for a mass poisoning with strychnine by the Frasers that killed dozens of them. William Fraser's killing campaigns caused the almost complete extinction of the Iman. Although the exact number of aboriginals he killed is unknown, they are estimated in the hundreds. He started his career as mass killer under Wheeler and later became officer with his own detachment. Called De Bill De Bill, by the aboriginals of southern Queensland, because of his frequent attacks on the tribes, he admitted in his late years that he had gone insane during those years of cruelty and bloodshed. The lands around Deebing Creek are owned today by Fraser's properties, raising serious concerns about the legitimacy of their ownership title, and questions regarding how the title to the lands were obtained. Although Fraser's Properties Australia bought the land at Deebing Creek in 2015, their real estate empire's claims on sovereign original lands are suspicious, unfounded, illegal, invalid, null and void. A first official Aboriginal reserve, to convey Christian instruction to the poor blacks, was attempted in Ipswich in the late 1840s, but it did not last. In the 1850s, travelling missionaries like Ripley operated in the region, but did not establish any permanent mission. Then, the Douglas government reportedly gazetted a reserve at Deebing Creek in 1877, but no record of it survived in the archives. These reports however attest of the Aboriginal presence around Deebing Creek during those years. Since 1855 in southeast Queensland, curfews were enforced to keep the Murrays out of town after dusk. After their workforce had been used during the day, the Murrays were forced out of towns for the night. Records mention Deebing Creek in 1861–62, when the last Aboriginals living on the site of the actual Queen's Park in Ipswich near the limestone kilns, were evicted and relocated at Deebing Creek, to join with already existing Aboriginal camps. The site of the actual park was a sacred gathering ground of the Yuggera, which they had defended when they fought their first battle against the colonists in 1827. There were two Bora grounds where tribes gathered in Queen's Park, one in the location of the actual park and another one across from Queen Victoria Parade where the girls' grammar school now stands. There are also Bunya Pines where Bunya or Bunya Nuts festivals gathered tribes since ancestral days. In 1862 it was appointed as a botanic garden, by the Government of Queensland to a board of trustees including the wealthiest landowners in Ipswich and members of Parliament, who prohibited camps. Queen's Park happened to be the first officially declared public park in the whole state of Queensland. Ipswich City Council later contested that these 80 hectares were owned by private interests and gained the ownership of the park by 1890, which it subdivided in 1891 to build the girls' grammar school. Hence, Deebing Creek entered the historic records with the expulsion of the Aboriginals from Ipswich. Native Police Camps in Queensland Old photo of a native police camp in Queensland. One. B.B. Establishment of the Deebing Creek Reserve and Mission. Various previous attempts at establishing missions had poorly failed for different reasons, including the opposition from settlers to concede any ground or the distrust the Aboriginals had toward the colonists. It is unclear why, while the Aboriginal Protection Society was active in Ipswich in the 1870s and a first reserve was gazetted in Deebing Creek in 1877 by the Douglas Ministry who gazetted other reserves, the records of this first reserve were lost and the society petitioned for another mission ten years later. This could indicate that the first reserve was dissolved or destroyed and its inhabitants chased or killed. Then in 1879, the McElraith government decided to cut government spending in the state's reserves, while expanding expenditures in the native police to crush the last remnants and pockets of resistance. 
Stories have survived in the oral tradition, but written records were silent or lost until the mission days. By the 1880s, the colonial expansion shifted from trying to subdue strong, numerous, independent tribes, to trying to assimilate and control mixed groups of subdued survivors largely reduced in number. The Griffith government in 1883 resumed the funding for reserves and for distributions of blankets. Missions became the safest refuges for survivors, where they were offered protection from the colonial genocides by the colonial authorities so many accepted to stay in spite of forced school and hard labor. The missions served to keep the aboriginals isolated, separated from the whites and closely supervised, while using their workforce for the colonization of lands, and gains in which they could never partake. The population of Deebing Creek, made until then of remnants and survivors of local or displaced tribes, gradually transformed during the mission days into a mixture of individuals uprooted outside of their family units, originating from various cultures and speaking different languages, thus accelerating the acculturation process and the assimilation of the new Murray community into the dominant society. Both church and state were engaged in a civilizing process, to dissuade inmates from their camp life. But according to stories and records, it seems nonetheless that some aboriginals near the missions kept living their camp life, hunting, fishing and gathering on the land, rather than adopting the mission life. In 1887–88, the Deebing Creek Mission was established by Presbyterian missionaries of the Aboriginal Protection Association of Ipswich, with Reverend Peter Robertson acting as its leading character. Minister for Ipswich since 1877, he had likely supported the first reserve at Deebing Creek that year. He was described by the press as convener of the Heathens Mission Committee, and was appointed as moderator for Queensland in 1886. That year, the missionaries succeeded in converting Melanesian plantation workers and decided to extend their ministry to the aboriginals at Deebing Creek, starting construction works in 1887. The association had a residence and a school built, completed in 1892. The first area of land to be gazetted as Aboriginal Reserve 177 was situated at what is now known as Lot 219 RP858789 and became a farm to sustain the mission. Additional portions of land were gazetted as Aboriginal Reserves in January, April and October 1892 the first reserve 371 in lieu of the water reserve and the second reserve 65 nearby on what is now lot 228 CC 2905, along the west bank of Deebing Creek, including what is now the gazetted cemetery reserve, lot 218. Two further portions of land 197 and 204 were purchased from Gutteridge and Wilkinson in 1897 to become reserves 191 and 772, enlarging the mission to 160 acres. Three additional portions of land bought in 1900 including portion 369 of 161 acres on the eastern side of the creek, formed together the nine-mile-long reserve. The mission covered 2,072 acres 839 hectares, including 200 acres 81 hectares, at Deebing Creek. Most land purchases were paid with the wages of the Murray workers, including ringbarking some 1,630 acres of the Grampian Hills and other similar works, so the residents of the mission bought the lands. But the lands were turned back to the Crown, as there was no possibilities for Aboriginals to own land. Old photo of Aboriginal tribesmen fishing in Brisbane River. Aboriginal camp in Brisbane in 1874. The so-called Crown lands acquired from leases for the Deebing Creek Reserve, that were later sold into freehold by the state of Queensland in 1984, were not only ancestral lands of the traditional owners, they were also purchased with the stolen wages from the labour of the Murrays at the mission. 
The lands at Debing Creek were thus stolen once from their Yugara Yugarapal traditional owners through the colonialist invasion, twice when they were ceded to the Crown after the Murray workers at the mission had bought lands with their labour, thrice when the territory was sold on freehold by the State of Queensland in 1984, and a fourth time when the lands around Debing Creek former mission including registered cultural heritage were sold to Fraser's property to have a suburb built over them. The dispossession of the Aboriginals has followed the pattern of the systemic invasion of their lands. Revered Edward Fuller of the Aboriginal Protection Society was the first superintendent in charge of the Debing Creek Mission on the location by the Bunya Tree. He recruited Murrays to reside as inmates. Ex soldier who had fought in Africa, India, and China, and done religious training to become minister, he had started a mission on Fraser Island, Queensland, in 1870 but it failed and closed soon after, because he could not stop white men from kidnapping Aboriginal women and girls. He attempted to start another mission on another island but it never manifested. He then held religious services at the Sandy Gallup Lunatic Asylum, before he became superintendent for Debing Creek, providing the mission with residents, supplies, tents and blankets, obtained from government subsidies given for each inmate. In 1889, there were still Murrays living around Ipswich, with some who had returned in Queen's Park, while a growing pressure for their eviction mounted. In April, the missionaries with a board of trustees formed the Debing Creek Committee for an Aboriginal home, planning to relocate the local Murrays. Some trustees were businessmen who concluded deals to supply the mission from their mills or shops. Some of them like Foot and Crib were called Towns Liberals, advocating colonial expansionism. The Murrays represented a workforce that some of the trustees and associates would later make use of. It is unclear why the Ipswich Murrays were not relocated to the newly started Debing Creek Mission. This may indicate that it had already a sufficient number of residents, or plans to expand the reserve. There were most likely camps at Debing Creek since there had been some recorded as soon as 1861. They were rather sent a few miles from Debing Creek to Perga, where there had been previous camps. In 1889, a 100-acre segregated mission and school were gazetted at Perga, causing settlers' opposition. To prevent the establishment of the mission in Perga, Local ranchers petitioned the government, without getting their request granted for the removal of the Murrays. But rising tension forced the mission to move one month later to Debing Creek, while the site at Perga was not used until 13 years later. A letter in 1892 reveals that the colonial authorities had discussed the extension of the reserve to Perga. Colonial Secretary Toza visited Debing Creek Mission that year and said that if the committee applied for a provisional school, he would use his influence to have it granted, which was done that same year and Toza then named the settlement the Aborigines, home for the district of Westmorden. In 1896, Foot petitioned the government, which purchased in 1897 two portions of land in the parish of Perga for the Debing Creek Aboriginal home, already gazetted, making Perga part of the reserve. The decision was once again met with fierce opposition from the settlers, who retaliated with threats. Robertson commented three years later about the time that mounting threats could lead to bloodshed. A 1897 report mentions a large number of deaths, with the change of season, and the dengue at camp. Reports from that year mention as many as 172 inmates, or more occasionally. In an obscure incident that same year when Perga was purchased, men were sent from nearby Whitecliffe to prevent murder. It was not until 1902 that the site at Perga was used by the Debing Creek Mission to start a school. The Debing Creek Mission became the main settlement on the reserve, reaching in the hundreds of Inhabitants according to photos and archives, with camps along the billabongs, farms and a school. 
Reports and photos of Debing Creek show tents, but also a few large buildings and series of cottages. The Debing Creek Mission received government funding starting in 1891. From 1894 to 1896, it received an annual grant of £250. With the conversion into an industrial school in 1896, the annual grant was augmented to £450. In 1897, the grant was increased to £550. In 1907, the management of the mission was transferred to the government. In 1914, the government decided to relocate the mission and school and a grant of £200 was made to assist the transfer of the school to Perga, where the mission committee purchased 62 acres of farmland to relocate the school and mission in 1915. Reverend Robertson had requested payment to assist the removal of the buildings to Perga, stating that for 25 years the mission had been spending more than it had received from the government. The Deebing Creek Mission operated until late 1915, when it was suddenly closed for obscure reasons. The Aboriginal Protection Association of Ipswich and the Deebing Creek Mission Committee were dissolved either from within or disbanded by the government that was supporting them with subsidies. The original 1917 order rescinding the reserve was not ratified, it seems, by the Queensland Parliament. The last residents were relocated to nearby Perga Mission or other reserves like Tarum and Baramba. About 85 inmates were sent from Deebing Creek Industrial School to the Perga Mission, which strangely, was gazetted as an industrial school only 22 years later in 1937, and it was operated until 1948. Some Murrays who went at Perga School are still alive today, or their children are. After the closure the site of Deebing Creek Mission was administered by the Salvation Army in 1920, and the same organization also operated the Perga Industrial School, until it was closed, 33 years later. The document from 1929 referred to the Salvation Army Aboriginal Colony at Deebing Creek attesting that it was still inhabited and mentioned the infestation of prickly pear cactus, showing the land was not cultivated anymore. A 1931 report by a ranger relating to the proposed opening of the Deebing Creek Mission area for selection stated that a school had been built on the southwest corner of Portion 204. The 1934 report of the Aboriginal Department indicated that the farm had been subdivided, and a considerable amount of ring barking and suckering had been carried out at Deebing Creek. These late reports confirm that the Aboriginal community kept using the land of the former mission after it closed. In 1967, Les Davidson and a group of Murray's descendants of the Deebing Creek and Perga missions started petitioning the government for the protection of the two Aboriginal cemeteries at both locations. In March 1968, an Aboriginal cemetery consisting of 4.8 perches was gazetted. Fenced and identified at Perga, and ten years later, the Deebing Creek Mission Aboriginal Cemetery Reserve was also gazetted. Deebing Creek was the first major mission on the East Coast that was home and refuge to many tribes. It was established for the survivors, scattered remnants of Southeast Queensland's Aboriginal people. Over 300 names of residents at the Deebing Creek Mission have been conserved in archives. Among the notables buried at the Deebing Creek Cemetery, a famous Yuggera chief named King Billy Turner, considered as the last traditional owner of the lands around Deebing Creek, left a lineage of descendants present in the vicinity, who have been greatly involved in the protection of the ancient site. Billan Billan, another influential elder, was a powerful Ugambe headman who was christened King Jackie Jackie or King Jackie Harvey of Laidley. After wars, he received a breastplate from the colonial authorities for advising his tribe to adopt a peaceful path and accepted to live at Deebing Creek Mission with his wife Mary Ann, seeking a safe refuge for his family and decimated tribe's survivors. 
He never converted to Christianity and he continued to perform his ancestral ceremonies at the mission. King Johnny Tarampa, also received a breastplate. He lived north of Ipswich and died around 1900, just about 35 kilometers from Deebing Creek. Photos show him with King Billy Turner sighted above. Bill and Bill and aka King Jackie Jackie, in 1887, and at Deebing Creek around 1900. King Billy Turner, sitting, center, and King Sandy, standing right with the vest. 1. BC, the Deebing Creek Aboriginal Home and Industrial School. Since its start, the mission kept some records, partly archived, of its residents and of certain activities. However, the mission records were described as partial, sketchy and omitting important information. Most of those files are letters or reports, addressing requests, accounting, and financial or legal matters. They contain some information conflicting with other reports and there are missing files and details. But some records mention various incidents or events providing clues into the history of the mission. The years 1891–98 left files in the archives attesting that state children were sent at the mission then. A 1894 police report states that native boys should not be allowed to come, as it unsettles the blacks. The report to the Colonial Secretary's office stated that there were about 20 children at school, there had been clearing of timber and two rail fencing erected, with 12 young men doing the work. There was also a cricket team at Deebing Creek which produced some successful and renowned athletes. That year the mission lists 62 Aborigines on station, half of them aged under 20 years old, with 27 attending school. Fitzgerald replaced Edward Fuller as teacher and superintendent. The institution he directed was registered as the Deebing Creek Provisional School No. 612, and the same number was kept when the school was moved to Perga in 1915, possibly with the building itself. A 1895 letter from the committee to the Colonial Secretary requests more accommodation for orphans. That year, the admission list to the school listed 25 names. The school was a 36 foot long by 13 foot wide rough slab, canvas lined building with shingles, near the superintendent quarters, and another hardwood building of 38 by 12 feet to accommodate children was to be turned in a schoolroom. The only evidence of the location of the school appears on the original plan, indicating that it was on reserve 371 granted in lieu of the water reserve, confirmed by a 1905 report from the chief protector. The mission house was situated on the southwest corner of the portion and the farm on the east end. Reverend Robertson officiated at all baptisms, marriages and funerals, remarrying the couples who had only a traditional marriage ceremony. Adults received reading, sewing, knitting and darning classes. In 1896, Commissioner Archibald Meston visited Deebing Creek for a second time and wrote a report stating that the mission provided home for up to 150 Aborigines, the children received school education, and the Aborigines provided labor for clearing, fencing, building and cultivation of lands. There was a mission house, buildings at the head of the creek and several houses for Aborigines, which Meston considered being too close together. He deplored the lack of good land for cultivation and the defective water supply to farm, but also noted that there were at the mission several half-castes, active and noble men, capable of doing regular work. He selected a group of Murrays from the mission to give a public demonstration of boomerang and woomera spear throwing at the North Ipswich Reserve. The residents were sometimes asked to do displays of their skills or athletic feats to raise some funds. Meston suggested buying farmland at Perga, which happened five years later, and moving the whole mission there to abandon the Deebing Creek site altogether, which happened nearly 20 years later. The proximity of white settlements caused that even at the mission, girls were not safe from assault. 
Meston requested that Murray girls and women be restricted from leaving the mission except for special occasions, in order to avoid the increase of half-castes, by limiting their encounters with white men. In 1896, Deebing Creek was proclaimed an industrial school and received an increased grant, provided it only accepted children of color. The report mentions 107 residents, including 36 schoolchildren. Fitzgerald was replaced as superintendent by Thomas Ivans, in that position until the mission closed. He was from the Salvation Army and stated that all the schoolchildren belonged to the Salvation Army. 1891 Map of Slavery in Australia the state appointed superintendent, with his wife Charlotte Emily Ivans as matron, received a £250 grant yearly and an extra £50 was granted for the building of rooms for orphans the year they moved in. The Myora Mission closed its school, its children were declared orphans and sent to Deebing Creek. The committee advised the government in November that it had bought adjacent land for £100 and asked for reimbursement. But instead of appointing its administration to trustees, the 110 acres of land were then ceded to the government the following May. The mission saw its annual grant raised to £550. The 1897 report says the population rose to 172 or more, but a large number of deaths were reported. The local oral tradition of the Aboriginal law can remember at least three massacres at Deebing Creek. The most well-known story refers to the killing by gunmen of a group of schoolchildren during the mission days, when the school teacher Ms. Julia Ford, whose headstone is dated 1896, was also killed. Accounts mention up to 50 or 60 children who were massacred there that day. In 2016, a radar survey conducted in the Mission Cemetery discovered an undisclosed number of mass graves, and another one in 2019 discovered two long trenches, with one of them measuring 29 meters long. According to one of her descendants, Julia Ford nay Sandy, was a Ugambe woman, her husband got her the headstone, an impressive economic feat in a time Aboriginal people were not allowed to handle money. This explains partly the unmarked graveyard and the natural stones used as markers. But exceptional efforts were made in putting up this one stone to identify the site for future memories. The single headstone is in the gazetted cemetery but all parties agree that burials exist beyond its limits. By 1897, the land had been fenced off into three portions and the houses and gardens had been fenced off from a common area. The land was farmed and fruit trees planted. Thirteen cottages had been built. The 1898 Committee's report to the Home Secretary for the Deebing Creek Aboriginal Home and Industrial School of Aboriginal and Half-Caste Children, declared 178 Aborigines at the home. Representatives of many different tribes from all parts of the colony, with four young sent out to work. The annual report that year mentions four births and eight deaths at the home and notes that only the older members of the tribes, have not yet renounced to the old wandering life, away from the home. That year, a half-caste, girl was removed for being too fair, and sent to Brisbane in domestic service. The following year another almost white, half-caste, girl was relocated to a school for white children. Segregation by skin color was enforced as rule. An inquiry was made relating to the parentage of the alleged white child now in possession of Aboriginal Clara Carbine, who was nursing the baby, with a note reading, It is certainly very undesirable that a quadroon should be living in a blacks camp. There were also inmates at Deebing Creek classified as Malay, Chinese, Melanesian or mixed blood. Under the Industrial and Reformatory Schools Act of 1865, so-called half-caste, children were classified automatically as neglected, and could be arrested and sentenced to be detained in a mission. 
it was the case of John Lynch, who was born in Alpha from an Aboriginal mother and a Chinese father. Although both of his parents worked and they owned their home, he was removed from them in 1902 and sent to Deebing Creek, for his education, but the 13-year-old boy was instead hired out. Lynch worked in Ipswich for founding members of the Deebing Creek Committee for 40 cents a week. In some cases, children were sentenced by judges to be removed to missions. It was the case of Maria Mackenzie, an 11 year old half caste girl who was removed from an Aboriginal camp, arrested, charged for being neglected, and sentenced to three years in detention at the industrial school in 1896. Because she had been raped by larrikins in town, the superintendent of Deebing Creek asked that she would be examined, because they could not treat a diseased female. At the mission, it was undesirable. A prison surgeon examined her and declared she was healthy. She was then admitted at the mission. During the late 1880s, colonial institutions and legislation took control over all aspects of the lives of Aboriginals and implemented segregation by skin color and lineage as a racist norm across Australia. The Aborigines Protection Act 1869 passed in Victoria and in 1886 in Western Australia, with the same year for Victoria the Half-Caste Act 1886 adopted as an amendment, gave exclusive control over the lives of Aboriginals to the Aboriginal Protection Board. The protectors of Aborigines could be local magistrates, religious ministers, jail wardens or police officers who had the power to separate families, remove children, and decide where the Aboriginals could live, work, travel, and who they could marry. These policies set the tone for the treatment reserved to the Aboriginals by the colonialist mindset of racist discrimination, to answer the question everyone asked, what shall we do with the blacks? and it paved the way for the Aboriginals' protection and restriction of the sale of Opium Act 1897 in Queensland. The British opium trade had been doing disastrous ravages with devastating effects in Aboriginal communities, especially in northern and western Queensland. Under those rules, all aspects of the Aboriginals and half-castes, lives were regulated, they were forced to request and carry permits to travel outside of the reserves, to work, trade, get married, attend social activities or go at pubs. Those permits commonly called dogs licenses, were hard to obtain and had to be deserved, with a complying behavior, to gain the favor of protectors whose own personal judgment made authority. They kept and managed wages earned by Aboriginal workers, forcing or preventing their every move. Aboriginals leaving the reserve without a permit could be subjected to three months of imprisonment. Non-Aboriginals except the appointed staff, were excluded from reserves and those who transgressed this law and established contacts with Aboriginal persons could be subjected to fines or imprisonment. The 1897 Act established the positions of protectors of Aborigines who administered the Act, and to whom a report was provided each year on each mission. It also provided for the establishment of government-run reserves, made provision for the removal of Aborigines to reserves, and provided for written agreements for the employment of Aborigines. The Act provided regulations to control the residence, movement, employment and wages, in effect, every aspect of the Aborigines' life. The Act also expanded official control over mixed-race families and the removal of children from their families. All rights fundamental to human choice and development were taken away and denied to Aboriginals. Subsequent amendments to the Act included similar regulations for the quadroons or quarter castes. Regulations under the Industrial and Reformatory Schools Act of 1865 allowed the hiring out of children under license, encouraging removals of residents from the schools to be used for child labor. Records show an important number of residents removed by the government into domestic service. 
Some children as young as four years old were attending school, like Gimpojo or Jim Edwards in 1903. There was even a Flory who was registered at Deebing Creek School when she was only one year old. Boys attended school until age 14 and girls until 15, after which they were sent out in service. In some cases, the children were hired out before that age, as it happened for Jackie, an eight-year-old. The next year, this nine-year-old was removed for employment, and never returned to Deebing Creek. In a 1901 letter to the Home Secretary, the committee recommended reducing the stipulated wages in order that the people may be induced to engage the dark-colored children, for work in their homes. These obscure pages of history have been too often concealed, but how can you reconcile black and white Australians today without full disclosure of our nation's black history? Wrote Joyce Capewell. Henry Merrick, a squatter wrote in 1846, No wild beast of the forest was ever hunted down with such unsparing perseverance as they Aboriginal people are. Men, women and children are shot whenever they can be met. Deebing Creek Missions Residence, Billan Billan is seen on the right, front row. Deebing Creek Cricket Team with Visitors. 1. BD increase in size of the Deebing Creek Mission rules and restrictions. Because of its population increase, the mission bought three farms at Deebing Creek and two at Perga. Starting in 1899, a correspondence between the mission committee and the Home Secretary's office discussed the sales of offered lands for the extension of the reserve and a status change to Crown land. In 1900, through a series of documents in a complex bureaucratic process, the Crown Solicitor and the Bank of New South Wales organised the Deebing Creek land purchases, a series of transactions in which three portions of land of 147, 127 and 161 acres were purchased from the bank for a £157.19.6 mortgage from the Home Secretary's office and transferred to the Deebing Creek Aboriginal station land, for absolute surrender to Her Majesty, and seven Union Jacks were sent to float at the mission. Apart from the loan, some of the land's purchase was paid with the stolen wages of the Murray workers. It can suggest that the mission and the Crown were involved in a lucrative land speculation transaction. Meanwhile, a group of settlers formed the Perga Divisional Board and petitioned the Home Secretary's office to create a nine-mile public water reserve in the parish of Perga, objecting to the territory being used as an Aboriginal reserve, but in spite of many letters their request was not officially granted. The land at Perga had been purchased by the mission in 1892 and had not been used because of threats and hostilities from the local residents who were using the land for water reserve and for grazing cattle. Reverend Robertson complained that the mission was unable to build a fence on a property they had owned for nine years, and that the timber and cream produced at the mission were being boycotted. Protests were organized against the fencing off of the reserve and its watering holes. Letters were sent opposing the reserve for Aboriginals who ought to be isolated and not planted amongst the traveling public, and negotiations to exchange gazetted portions of land were proposed by the local colonists. Soon after, the mission wrote letters to the Home Secretary requesting for the annual grant to be further considered and addressing the reduction in voucher allowance, as the government funding was reduced. In 1901, letters and articles refer to the Nine Mile Reserve, in the parish of Perga, still under dispute. Petitions circulated for and against a mission at Perga, and one of the portions previously obtained was exchanged for another by the Home Secretary, while a road was built for public access to waterholes. In 1901, the government required that deaths be reported. The mission recorded six deaths in the year. The mission was paid per head with government subsidies and gathered at Deebing Creek children and adults from about 60 locations from northern Queensland to central New South Wales, as well as indentured servants from blackbirded Pacific Islanders communities. 
The missions and government's policies were then sanctioning the separation of families and spouses, and the removal of children from their parents for forced assimilation into the colonialist society, often inspired by eugenicist ideologies. From 1897 to 1902, a dozen of sentenced reformatory inmate children were interned at Deebing Creek. In 1901, an eight-year-old boy named Harry Wilson was sentenced to three years at Deebing Creek for hiding money although, when questioned about it, he made no attempts at denial and simply returned it. In a series of memos, the superintendent was asked to report separately the vouchers for the inmates at the industrial school amounting to 18, from those residing at the mission, an additional 19. Twenty-two more names were listed as sent to the station without proper paper, often by the police. In July, a letter notified that vouchers would only be granted for children coming from other districts. Robertson inquired for the documents of four half-caste, children, a young woman and two infants, without which he had no control over them. Registration of qualified inmates for vouchers mattered. At the end of the year, 19 children inmates of the Reformatories Act were returned to the home. Reports from 1902 state that the children from the district and children arriving with adults were to be maintained without cost for the government. From then on, the home was paid subsidies only for the children coming alone from other districts and committed under the Reformatory Act, until age 15. That year, the home was also paid for two unmarried blind women, at the same rate than for children. The 1902 report for the Deebing Creek Industrial School listed 17 children, with four of them transferred, two discharged as their sentence expired, one girl sent in service and only ten left at school. Reduced subsidies and the opposition to the mission might be part of the reasons for the lower number. Yet the same year, letters reveal that the home was enlarged, being too small for the attending children. It is also that year that a first school and a settlement were established in Perga and a number sent there. Such discrepancies make it hard to know the real numbers of inmates, or what budgets were used for. The records indicate that inmates arrived and left the home at a rapid rate, to be relocated on other reserves or contracted for indentured work as teenagers, losing or limiting contact with other inmates. Although the fragmented records do not account for such numbers, some oral stories say that thousands could have transited through the Deebing Creek Mission during the 30 years or so of its existence. In 1940, the concept of responsibility towards the blacks, and responsibility of civilization to the Aborigines, whose extinction it has threatened, started to emerge and be openly addressed in the press. The Day of Remembrance of Australia's Real Pioneer, was set aside throughout Australia, but only observed by a few rare churches, yet according to a Queensland Times article, much ground for thought was provided, enabling a clearer conception of the real obligations of the community to create conditions that would elevate the status of the dark people, would treat more kindly their racial and social requirements, would show an appreciation of their moral and spiritual peculiarities, would relieve the half-caste of his yoke would stimulate ambition and engender a sense of self-help amongst those desiring to exist in their own colonies, and would generally give inspiration to live again in the old vigor that once characterized the race. It was not until 1967 that these discriminatory policies and the unjust regulation of the colonialist institutions such as the 1897 Act and the Protectors, controlling the Aboriginals' lives with limiting permits were finally rescinded, when an overwhelming majority of Australians voted in a referendum for their abolition. And the Aboriginals became citizens. But they had to wait until the Racial Discrimination Act of 1975 for the federal government to legislate against racial discrimination in the provision of access to places, accommodation, goods and services. Yet, many sovereign original peoples refused to be called Australian Aboriginals under colonialist law. 
many emphasise that they are not Australian citizens nor subjects to the British Crown, but sovereigns. They declare that being included in the Australian Constitution would signify the extinguishment of their never ceded sovereignty and give the right to the Commonwealth to legislate and rule over them. They say from lessons learned from history that under British Australian rule, the originals will always remain an impoverished and marginalised minority facing inequality, with the same issues and debates. They will always find themselves battling political ill will through complex, deceiving, manipulative and discriminatory legal systems that maintain them on the losing side, without any improvement. Policies of children removals, over-representation in jails and deaths in custody are still major issues that highlight the repressive discrimination the original peoples still suffer from, in their homelands. To this day, the stolen generations and the stolen wages from the missions era are still pending issues left unresolved and generally uncompensated, that left painful memories in the Australian history and society that too often are widely brushed off, denied, hidden, forgotten, ignored, avoided or minimised. Schoolchildren at Deebing Creek Mission. 1. VE reductions in grants, government administration and indentured work. In January 1903, the Under Secretary notified the Home of further rearrangements regarding the payments for orphans, and committee children, suggesting additional reductions in the allowances. In March, the government announced that the allowances for a child now ceased at the age of 12. Some inmates were allowed to be hired out without a permit, to alleviate the expenses of the mission. In a following memo from the Department of Public Lands regarding vouchers for the maintenance of children, the list refers to the coppers, as the children of half-caste and black, to be counted apart. The records for that year list 27 adult females, 35 adult males, 32 child females and 36 child males. Schoolchildren are classified as three blacks, five coppers, 25 half-castes and four whites. The 1904 annual report was a copy of a previous one about general activities and mentioned no names. At least seven children and young adults died at the home that year and four more the following year. Improvements to the buildings and on the mission property were reported for the value of over £250. A 1905 report lists 68 children committed at the school in 10 years, with 33 still attending. This suspiciously low figure does not agree with the added numbers of reports for the previous years. That report reveals that many of the children were very diseased. Many had their sentence finished or remitted, or were relocated. Sixteen train passes were obtained to send boys to Riverview Reformatory. A memo from June counts the half caste inmates at 22 males under 16 year old and 12 aged 16 or over, with 32 females under 16 and 20 aged 16 or over, amounting to 34 males and 52 females for a total of 86 half castes. 54 of them under 16, without counting the other residents. The fact that the government asked for inmates to be classified by color and that the 1905 report accounts only for half-castes, denotes the interest of the authorities in civilizing, primarily that group. Files from the years 1903 to 1907 and from 1910 to 1912 are mysteriously missing from the archives. Only a few letters were conserved from those years, concerning the transfer or admittance of inmates. From the records, it appears that a large number were removed for employment by the government. The names and numbers of children and adults who transited at the home in those years are unknown or uncertain more than throughout the rest of its history, although records are only partial and scarce. These were only a handful among the many who became part of the stolen generations of Aboriginals. In 1906, a Murray man named Darkey was sent to Deebing Creek for having made an attack, with a spear on the superintendent at Baramba. 
On his arrival at Ebing Creek, the story had been blown out of proportion, with hearsay that he had killed and eaten a missionary. The superintendent Ivans warned him that he would be shot if he was to be a bad boy, and fired his gun in the air a few times. Darkey behaved, but kept wandering with his spear, hunting and fishing, and wearing only a loin cloth. Children sentenced to become inmates and those escaped from missions were often chased, arrested, held in custody and escorted by officers, agents of the native police often being deputed for the tasks. In 1896, police reports tracked the moves of John Young who refused to give up his son Alec, aged about 13, and abducted, him. The two escaped from the constables for two years but finally got caught. The boy was sent to Westbrook Reformatory School for three years and then to Deebing Creek in 1901. In 1905, Peter Graham had his three children removed and sent to Deebing Creek to give them a little education, and to remove them from their camp life surroundings, according to some chief protector. In a similar case in 1907, Billy Brown, a Murray cricket player and influential overseer at Deebing Creek, refused to let his two sons continue their indentured work on a distant estate, causing him to face expulsion from the mission for opposing government regulations under the Aborigines Protection Act. In an example of family split, Chief Protector Coston replied in 1907 to a letter from George Beckett, a Murray father at Deebing Creek asking for the return of his son from a year-long labor employment on a distant estate. Yourself and his mother may think you know what is best for the boy but I can assure you that you do not, and that is why the Chief Protector is charged with the very great responsibility of protecting Aborigines, mothers, fathers and children in the dealings with the white man. Eight months later, Ms. Beckett wrote in another letter concerning this decision, This is very hard upon me as I am very ill and am fretting very much over him. I don't know of any reason why he should not be allowed to visit me as I am not bad nor drunken woman, I have always stood by my boy. She received this reply two weeks later. Jack is at service but his master has kindly agreed to allow Jack to go to the mission to see his mother. And he may remain with her till Saturday. When his master expects him to return. Their correspondence also informs us that tuberculosis was present at Deebing Creek Mission then. There may have been various diseases and epidemics at Deebing Creek, as it was often the case in missions and segregated schools, partly explaining the years of missing records and population drops. Reports from 1896 refer to many children in poor health and a large number of deaths were noted. Records mention deaths attributed to dengue in 1897, and six died of an influenza epidemics in 1900. Other records mention malaria, but the consumption disease or tuberculosis appeared over many years. Cases were reported at least since 1897, with numerous cases in 1903 and 1906, according to archives. In 1903, Eight-year-old Tommy Howden said to be a Kanaka, Hawaiian, had a contagious skin disease, possibly the same Tommy said to be of Malay background, sent to Deebing Creek from a leper station. In 1906, a 24-year-old woman named Nancy Chapman died of breathing problems in minutes. Throughout the whole existence of the mission, Murrays were chased from most towns at dusk and became vagrants, with the old, weak and destitute often left behind, unable to follow or find a camp. Records show that these outcasts were often arrested by the police and sentenced to stay in missions. Among them, some had a frail or poor health and were more vulnerable to newly introduced diseases. Living conditions and the food quality in missions were often poor and health care was rarely provided. Missions including that of Deebing Creek were also used as labor pools where neighboring or distant planters, ranchers or miners, would pick manpower and maids to work on their estates, usually for free, in a form of slave trade and forced labor. 
when wages were given, they were paid directly at the protector, who administered the income. In a case recorded at Deebing Creek, a 14-year-old Murray boy named Bertie Brown was contracted in 1908 for herding cattle, but removed and relocated after four years for killing cattle. In another example from Deebing Creek, a Murray young man called Martin Bly was contracted as a stable hand in 1909, but escaped and returned to the mission, where the superintendent asked his master to come and take him back to work, which was done within days. Julia Ford's descendant wrote eloquently about the mission, it was a place where mixed race, children were to be educated at the industrial school to become laborers and domestics, and a place where the full bloods and their ways inconsistent with white society, were to spend their final days a place to smooth the pillow of a dying race. It was here that our grandparents, my own included, were stripped of their language, their culture, and their identity all to be remade in the image that white people wanted for them. Forbidden from their cultural practices, including burying the dead the aboriginal way, a cemetery was started. Not a single grave is marked, except one the grave of my great-great-grandmother, Julia Ford. Deeping Creek Mission was a tool of genocide, a place where we were to see the end of our days, a concentration camp. Our old ones were fighters though who fought to not only stay on their country in whatever capacity they could, but who in secret and on threat of punishment, continued to tell our sacred stories, sing our songs and speak our language. Thanks to them, I am alive today. If the mission managers could see us now, they'd be rolling in their graves. Deebing Creek Mission, photo from a postcard in 1903. Residents at Perga Mission. 1. BF work accomplished at the mission. The aboriginals at the mission were employed to do logging, farming, building, fencing and herding. Deebing Creek Mission had a school, with the old well still visible today, a graveyard protected today, a farm with cultivated areas and vast pastures, several buildings, houses and camps, and a cricket field. The date palm tree and a mango tree planted then still stand today. There were 100 grape vines, apple and peach trees, and other fruit trees. Watercress was sown in the creek and gardens were grown. The waterholes, pastures, landscaping and some trees and plants are the legacy of their ancestral labor. Occasional visitors from Ipswich or elsewhere came to mission. Red Gum described in 1892 how the creek had been deepened, providing an abundance of beautiful drinking water, several little farms apportioned to some industrious blacks, each growing vegetables and fruit trees, as well as a fernery and series of substantial and well-built, cottages. All the timber necessary was fell and split on site. All around there were signs of their industry. All who go out there must feel gratified at the progress observable. Townspeople will be surprised, if they visit the Aboriginal station, as the progress that is noticeable in the surroundings has been made in the direction of improving the condition of the blacks in this district, that the interest in their welfare will be maintained, so as to dispel the gloom and scatter warmth around the future existence of what, in some cases, are probably the last of their tribe. In 1892, the Sunday school service gathered 51 community members at the sound of the bell, for a chorus with cornet, tambourines and triangle, followed by prayers. School classes also opened and closed daily with hymns and prayers. Several aboriginals knew how to read and write or were learning. The Deeping Creek Station cricket team formed in 1894 was reputed to perform well in competitions against other teams, playing in Ipswich and Brisbane. One of the founding members of the team, John Curtis, was even selected to represent Queensland, but for some obscure reasons, this never happened. Albert Henry, an extremely quick bowler, was one of the best-known Aboriginal in Australian cricket. Selected to play for the Queensland team, the press described him as the fastest bowler in Australia. 
but the umpires no-balled him and segregation in the team abridged his short cricketing career in 1905. In 1908, he was relocated from Debing Creek to Baramba because he started to defy the authority. Other Murrays from Debing Creek became successful athletes, as the professional runner Billy Bowen. Charlie Samuels, once champion runner of the world, might have visited Debing Creek Mission, as his father Combo lived there in 1900 and it was on the way between their home in Bunya and Sydney. In 1907, the Debing Creek Mission Committee ceded the control of the station to the government. That year, a 20,000 Imperial Gallons underground tank was constructed to help with the water supply. The Protector's Report published a photograph showing eight houses and over 70 people outside. That year, the Murrays at the mission wanted to participate in a footrace in Ipswich called the Sheffield Handicap and for that purpose, the operation of the 1897 Act controlling their moves was suspended. In 1909, a new house to accommodate the committal children was built near the school. The farms had increased their production of vegetables, meat and milk and sold some to bring income to the mission. In 1910, the Protector's Report noted a marked improvement in the homes and lives of the residents and that the Aboriginal people made the mission their true home. In 1912, two new homes were erected. The Deeping Creek Mission was closed in 1915 and 85 of its residents were removed to Perga Mission. It is unclear what happened to the buildings and houses, if they were still used, relocated or destroyed. There are indications suggesting that the school building could have been moved to Perga Mission. After Deeping Creek Mission closed in 1915 and Perga in 1948, survivors of the missions and their descendants were left homeless, destitute, helpless and scattered, often living in temporary rudimentary camps near towns, as wandering transients and vagrants. By the 1920s and 1930s, a number of large shanty towns appeared at or near former camping grounds, housing a sizable number of indigenous inhabitants. These evolved from poverty and discrimination, but were more hygienic and independent than was usually assumed. They were dismantled during the 1950s, but many Aboriginal families in and around Brisbane today can trace a connection to these places. Quote, Mapping Brisbane History Debing Creek Mission, CA 1900. Former mission site today. The birthing tree on the left is the same one on the hill, above in the centre. 1. Carchaeological heritage of Debing Creek. 1. CA pre-colonial times. Some ancient stone tools, and worked or chipped stones, have been found in the Debing Creek area, namely around the Ipswich Pony Club, where the land was cleared to create open pastures and corrals. Other artifacts found on the grounds include stone arrangements, rock wells, sharpening grooves, grinding stones, scar trees, throwing sticks, boomerangs, and human remains, with some exposed. Ancient stone arrangements on the site of the old mission include some circles, cairns and alignments. The entire site has never been thoroughly researched, while some sensitive locations are kept secret. There are definitely ancient burials and ceremonial sites that should stay concealed and untouched. 1. CB – Colonial and Mission Days some traces of landscaping, dams and the old mission well are still visible, as well as one headstone. The gazetted cemetery has at least two mass graves with remains and room for more unmarked graves. Old photos and records of the mission days are found in archives, stories were passed as oral tradition. Old fences and traces of old constructions can be seen on the land with keen and attentive observation. Old metal tools have been found, as well as old bottles and jars, with certainly more to be unearthed. There are two piles of fallen trees at Lower Camp overgrown with bush likely dating from colonial days. The pit there was used as a dump apparently for some decades. 
There are also two military medal hangars from WW2, with two car wrecks from those years next to them, by the mission location at Upper Camp. 1. CC – Human Remains Apart from probable ancient burials, and the old Mission Cemetery registered as State Heritage in 2004, the Aboriginal community is aware of at least three massacre sites where human remains are visible. Additionally, ground-penetrating radar surveys conducted in 1985, in 2016 and in 2019 revealed the presence of at least two mass graves overlapping the cemetery boundary, one measuring 29 metres long by two deep. These are just known evidences of burials and human remains, with certainly more on site. The first site described here consists of at least four small pits in the gully and ancient billabong behind the bunya tree at the mission, each pit about one metre wide and containing charcoal lime and bones. A thin layer of soil thrown over these pits after they were used left them partly exposed on the surface. An old rusted tool unearthed next to a pit there resembles a slave head shackle or a large butcher hook. The second and third massacre sites listed here are a medium size and a large pit next to each other, the smaller on the bank and the largest pit in the gully that used to be connected with an ancient billabong. They are situated near Lower Camp also known as Site 2, by the Ipswich Pony Club on the north side of Centenary Highway, and like the previously mentioned site, were used to dispose of multiple corpses. The process used for disposal of corpses was similar in those three sites, including dismemberment, covering the body parts in quicklime, available from the kilns in limestone, Ipswich only 8 km away. Then pyres were built over the corpses' piles, baking the quicklime which settled into the bone tissues. Finally the burnt pyres were buried under soil or in the case of the largest pit, several mounds of dirt. Views of the largest massacre pit with some of the mounds inside it. Baked lime coating covering most of the bottom of the pit. Erosion has exposed remains and quicklime has washed off at the bottom. A forensic anthropological research on quicklime burials by E. Schotsmans in 2012 discovered that the Analysis of the bones and lime have proven that the quicklime burials are the result of cremation with the use of crushed rock carbonate, which must have covered the dead body. During cremation, there is an exchange of the carbon between the bioapatite of the bone of the body on the one hand and the atmosphere, the fuel and the crushed limestone on the other hand. Due to this the cremated bones take up infinite old carbon from the limestone and therefore have an apparent age that can be even older than the first human occupation. Furthermore, recent studies have demonstrated that the lowest level of almost all lime burials consists of badly cremated bones, black instead of white, and soil but without lime. Referring to this research on limestone burials, Catherine Myers Emery, found in mortuary archaeology, commented, Lime is one of the major finds in many forensics cases dealing with clandestine burials due to this popular notion of its ability to remove the identity of the deceased and destroy the remains. A new study by Schotzmans et al. 2012 used pig corpses to test different types of lime to see how it changed the remains. In general, they discovered that the lime was highly effective in preventing decay and protecting the body, rather than destroying it. These excerpts are quoted for their relevance in describing the process used to dispose of corpses after massacres, and the aspect of the lime-coated baked remains discovered and observed in the three aforementioned sites identified on the grounds at Deebing Creek. Those three sites are referred to as massacre sites, but are more accurately pits used for the disposal of multiple corpses after massacres. Their designation here as first, second and third site, are unrelated to their chronology or importance. The second of these sites is a medium-sized shallow pit a few meters in diameter. On the bank of the gully at Site 2, in which are patches of quicklime mixed with charcoals and bones mostly of infant size. 
On its edge, bordering with the edge of the largest pit, there is a small sand mound about 1.5 meter high, in which can be seen partly burnt pieces of wood as well as charred bones. Apparently, no lime was used in this mound. In the medium pit, quicklime was used in small amounts in a few patches and partly covered with shallow soil, a technique less elaborated than the way it was done in the largest pit. The third of the massacre pits listed here is by far the largest. Dug out from the banks of a gully, it stretches approximately 50 by 100 meters and may easily contain remains of hundreds of individuals. Since the medium shallow pit next to it shows less remains and a less organized processing of corpses, the site was most probably used on multiple occasions by many people, as well as the largest pit itself which contains between 10 to 15 large mounds, measuring a few meters tall by a few meters wide. Those mounds are covered with soil, but weathering has washed off their sides into the gully, exposing layers of quicklime that form patches at the bottom of the pit, and hundreds of pieces of lime-coated baked bones and remains, as well as bottles and broken glass in or emerging from some of the mounds. One ceramic shard from a moonshine bottle shows the date of 1878, found on site with broken glass. Due to the erosion of the mounds, the quicklime and lime-coated remains cover large parts of the pit. Observation of the exposed remains has revealed the presence of various children and adult size parts. No complete skull was found, but partial jaws and broken pieces of parietal plates seem to be present, maybe indicating that the bodies were beheaded, possibly for the body parts trade of the colonial days. Some historians estimate that around 80,000 Aboriginal skulls from Australia were sent to collectors and museums in Europe during the 1800s, in what became a lucrative market of body parts and bones. The Museum of Natural History in London, England, admittedly keeps the remains of 3,000 Aborigines. Whether those mounds used for disposal of corpses were all made on the same occasion is improbable. It required a large manpower working for days to dig, build and operate so many pyres and mounds, and dispose of so many corpses through the process used, as the evidences in situ clearly demonstrate. This large pit was apparently used for disposal of corpses on multiple occasions, probably over a relatively short period of time and by the same group or related groups using the same site and process. Although some have suggested that they could be cow bones, the bones are too small to be from cows. Furthermore, there are no traces of horns, hooves or skulls, and the amount of work to dispose of that large number of corpses is totally inconsistent with any known agricultural practice, here or elsewhere. In one more location near the actual construction development expanding Binney's Road, fragments of infant-sized lime-coated bones were also found suggesting that there could be more similar massacre sites or sites where corpses were disposed of on the grounds at Deebing Creek, and also ancient burials. By approving the construction works, the city of Ipswich could erase all traces of its untold history, while destroying a wildlife ecosystem rich in cultural significance, still home of the original owners. The urbanization project for Deebing Creek includes government-subsidized military housing for the adjacent Amberley Air Force Base, the largest one in Australia, to destroy the Aboriginal heritage of Deebing Creek Mission and Reserve would equal to repeating the sad pages of the dark, horrific past. There is not enough evidence gathered yet to identify who were the culprits committing these atrocities, but the consistent use of large quantities of quicklime points toward Ipswich, first known as limestone. The first lime mine and kilns were built and operated in 1827 by five convicts, soon joined by soldiers. The local aboriginals were described as friendly, but after trying to evict the first convicts in 1827, troops were sent with them to Limestone to guard and protect them from possible further interference. 
For the first years, it was a penal settlement where convicts were sent to forced labor in the mine and kilns, under a military escort. The first limestonians were all involved in the production of quicklime. Before long, the operation was sending by boat to Brisbane 300 to 400 bushels of quicklime each day. The mining settlement adopted the name Ipswich in 1843. In 1846, its registered population counted a minority of 100 whites. In 1851, it reached 932, and only five years later, it had increased to nearly 2,500. In 1863, it amounted to over 3,000, the year after the local Aboriginals were moved to Deebing Creek. Numerous massacres often involving the native police were reported in southeastern Queensland from the 1850s to the early 1900s, with several not far from Deebing Creek from 1857 to 1860 and in 1896. The first gazetted reserve 177 at Deebing Creek in 1877 was near the large pits and was mysteriously erased with the following administration which defunded reserves and promoted native police attacks. During the American Civil War in the 1860s, cotton was grown around Ipswich to replace the supplies. Like in the United States, growing cotton required a large manpower and slaves were most often used. Blackbirded Pacific Islanders were used as laborers on the plantations, as well as local aboriginals. Ipswich kept growing fast in the next decades. The limestone kilns were operated until the late 1800s. The town kept expanding its urban developments and various industries, encroaching continuously on traditional Aboriginal territory, using the lands and resources while destroying the natural environments and ecosystem habitats, for an economy that left the original inhabitants and custodians like outcasts. In the last two decades of the 19th century, with the rise of eugenicist ideologies, intolerance and hatred of the aboriginals increased among the colonialists, with pressure for a homogenized white Australian population and racial cleansing, through elimination, assimilation and outbreeding, of aboriginals. Movement spread for the expulsion of the aboriginals from towns and segregation was the norm. Two. Early efforts to protect Ebing Creek 1967 to early 2000s. 2A The Deebing Creek Mission Cemetery Reserve. Starting in 1967, Aboriginals in Ipswich sought to have the Deebing Creek Mission Cemetery protected. During the first year of his life, Les Leslie Davidson was relocated with his family to Deebing Creek. The following year in 1915, they were removed again and sent to Perga Mission and Industrial School. In 1968, Les and his group asked the government for the protection of both cemeteries at Deebing Creek and Perga and succeeded in having the Perga Cemetery protected, fenced and marked with signs. In 1973, Les Davidson asked the directors of the State Department of Aboriginal and Island Affairs for the Aboriginal Cemetery at Deebing Creek to be granted a protection status. The state charged the Morden Shire Council to assess the presence and boundaries of the said cemetery at Deebing Creek. Only one headstone was on site, that of Ms. Julia Ford from 1896, but rough natural stones used as headstones marked an unknown number of graves overgrown with lantana and hidden under the brush. Local Murrays, many of whom had families buried had the cemetery, were willing to restore the site. When contacted, the property owners objected that they were not ready to cede any land for a cemetery. The issue was transferred to the Land Administration Commission, to organize a survey in May 1974. The commission found records of the reserve, but no cemetery had ever been gazetted or registered. The Minister for Conservation, Marine and Aboriginal Affairs, Neville Hewitt, intervened and urged the Minister for Lands and Forestry, Wallace Ray, to have the area of the Mission Cemetery reserved. 
Les Davidson's original request was for 2 hectares 20,000 square meters, but after a meeting with the regional director for the Commonwealth Department of Aboriginal Affairs, it was resolved that an area of 20 by 100 meters 2,000 square meters would be acquired as a cemetery reserve cleared and fenced for which the costs would be met by the Commonwealth Government under the Aboriginal Trust provisions. The Land Commissioner agreed that the site would be compulsorily acquired in case of refusal by the owners to surrender the land. And it would be administered by a Board of Trustees, as was the case for the Perga Cemetery. A 20-metre-wide easement would be added around it, as a buffer zone and to provide access to the site, extending the entire cemetery reserve to 3,600 square metres. In February 1976, 3,600 square metres of land were gazetted as Deebing Creek Aboriginal Cemetery. Compulsory acquisition of the portion of land was required, as the reserve was opposed by the owners. The lands of the Deebing Creek Mission had been ceded to the Crown during the time of the mission. A road accessing the site was also gazetted and surveyed. First gazetted as portion 218 in 1976, the boundaries of the reserve were adjusted in 1980 to 3,565 square metres, and the cemetery was gazetted as lot 228 CC 2905 placed under the control of the Director of Aboriginal and Islander Advancement. The owners of the land lease received compensations from the government for the concession of land. Les Davidson helped by some friends started clearing the area from the lantana and brush. He found 63 headstones marking graves and staked them with pegs. He obtained fences for the cemetery in 1978, but died on Easter that year. His friends continued his work of fencing and clearing the cemetery area. The local Aboriginals were already concerned about development in this area they wanted protected. Their community started reusing the territory for cultural activities, gatherings, and planned on a recreational areas for picnic sporting events, including cricket, football and basketball, and elderly homes. Liaison officer Skinner reported the situation to the government, noting that it would require considerable land and money to allow these projects and the opening of a good road for public access. He noted also that the fence newly built had already been damaged, but the perpetrators were unknown. That same year, historian William Thorpe began investigating the graves at Deebing Creek and was told that a photographic survey would take place in 1979, but there are no record proving it happened. In March 1978, he was informed by the Department of Aboriginal and Islander Affairs that the files from Deebing Creek and Perga were unavailable and that the government had started its own research. On September 9, 1978, the first meeting of the Deebing Creek Cultural Association took place with Thorpe, Mr. and Ms. Chong and Mr. Robertson, with the goal of identifying and marking the graves. In 1981, Thorpe represented a group wanting to purchase portion 218 wrongfully thought to be a leasehold land and wrote to the Minister for Lands, but their request to buy the reserve was not granted. Thorpe left an important amount of information in his research about Deebing Creek, yet his attempt to buy the cemetery reserve just five years after it had been gazetted may reveal his interest and motives. He documented at least 13 names of people buried in the Deebing Creek Cemetery that were provided to him by Les Davidson, as well as lists of residents at the mission and details from archives. For five years, the community volunteered to maintain and preserve the cemetery and surrounding land. In 1984, the Les Davidson Memorial Park and Deebing Creek Historical Cemetery Organization were created with Frances Wright, daughter of Les Davidson as chairperson, and the mayor of Ipswich and Senator Neville Bonner as trustees to preserve the site, raise interest in its history and provide activities. Groups of children were taken to the site to learn about Aboriginal culture, 
through bush activities and camping, aiming to bring indigenous and non-indigenous together and learn to build better relations. In August, photos of the site were taken, showing the pegs that Les Davidson had left to mark graves. In October, the newly created Memorial Park wrote to the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs to advise him of their projects and fundraiser to establish a caravan park and a visitor centre near the cemetery, through an application by a trust to obtain assistance from the Community Employment Programme. Farmers O'Neill and Adams still refused to sell their lease of the site and O'Neill shot his rifle whenever Aboriginal peoples were visiting the grave sites. In 1984 the land was put on sale to build a golf course. In 1985, the Department of Aboriginal Affairs funded an electronic scan of the cemetery to try to locate grave sites, but the results were not conclusive. By that time, the entry road had been badly eroded and the cemetery could only be accessed by the property of the Walsh family, adjacent to the reserve. Stanley took magnetometer images in a geophysical survey identifying possible human burials, but officially, the results were affected by metal, and the exact location of the survey has not been archived. In November 1985, an order in council rescinded the proclamation of a portion of land of 55.847 hectares 138 acres in the Ipswich Land Agents District, Parish of Perga, which had been proclaimed for public purposes and gazetted in August 1886. The area sold on freeholder line with the Aboriginal Reserve 177 proclaimed on 2 January 1892, that was reduced in size in the Regazettal in 1901. 2B – Mobilization for the Protection of Deebing Creek Mission. In mid-December 1985, Les Davidson's brother and sister, Ruthven Budget Davison and Doreen Thompson organized a sit-in and set up two camps on the private lands near the cemetery to obtain land rights and freehold title of the reserve, claiming that there were Aboriginal remains outside of the boundaries of the cemetery. The group was claiming 400 hectares and two identified cemeteries, believing that there was 231 graves in the fenced-in reserve cemetery alone. The newspaper claimed, more than 1,000 Ipswich Aborigines will set up protest tents on land at Deebing Creek near Ipswich. 